In this video, I will be quickly going over three agriculturally important families of mites. The Tarsanemid mites, the Tentronychid mites, and the Areophyid mites. Um, the first group of mites is the Tarsanemids. Tarsanemids are the family that broad mite and cyclamen mite belong to, and they are called thread-footed mites, mainly because if you look at the picture, you can see that similar to the tetranychid mite on the right, they have a lot of hairs uh, and, and setae or seedy, but um, you can tell that on the southmost legs, they have threads or hairs that are right next to their feet. Um, the second group that I'll be going over are the tetranychid mites. The tetranychids are pretty well known. A lot of them are pests. Um, the most well-known species would probably be Tetranychus urticae. Um, that's the two-spotted spider mite. Uh, a lot of people are very aware of this group and uh, the mites that are in it as pests. The third and last family is the Areophyid mite family. These are uh, gall mites or blister mites as they're sometimes known and the vast majority of them are actually quite innocuous. They aren't actually great pests and you wouldn't really know that they were there unless you took a, a microscope and looked at them. The most well-known species of this family are hemp russet mite, tomato russet mite, aloe mite, um, salsola mite, and there are a couple of others that are pretty pretty big pests but the vast majority of this family is actually not quite that bad. Even if you don't know the families or very many of the species in these families, their damage is pretty consistent. And if you look at the kind of damage that I'm going to show you in the next few photos, you'll be able to better identify what kinds of pests are appearing in your crops, along with other information like the species of plants that you're growing, and the season, and a few other attributes. But essentially, Damage is helpful, diagnostic, and indicative in some cases. So first up we have Tetranychidae. Tetranychidae is a very well-known family of mites. They are the spider mites. When somebody refers to a spider mite, they're usually referring to this family, unless otherwise stated. Tetranychus urticae is a very popular and very well-known infamous species that is a pest of hundreds of crops. It causes damage by sucking out the juices, um, the cellular juices of the plant, and it causes this sort of stippling, which you can see in this Gerber leaf that I've propped up here. You can also see an example diagram of a Tetranychus mite. This particular one, I believe, was meant to be Tetranychus urticae because you can see the um, the sort of spotting on both sides, which is two spots, two spots spider mite. Although there are plenty of mites that have a similar sort of configuration, and certainly it can be said that two spotted spider mites don't always have a very visible um, two spots, certainly. You can also see in the video here how the Tetranychus urticae mite travels across a Gerber leaf and how different Tetranychus species can look a little bit different. Here in particular, you can see that we have two Tetranychus urticae on one leaf, but one of them is a green color, the other is red, and that's seasonal. Sometimes these mites will look a different color depending on the kind of crop that they're on, depending on the time in the season. Um, there's a different factors that can occur and cause this sort of influence on the physiology of a spider mite. And it's important to not get caught up in the sort of common name. So just because something is called a carmine mite, or just because something is called um, a red mite, or something like that, doesn't mean that's always going to be red in some capacity. Besides stippling damage, another thing that one can look for, if they're not totally sure that the damage that they're seeing is spider mite related, is looking for webbing. Spider mites get the name from the fact that they produce 
a silken web, especially in large colonies. And it might be a little bit hard to see, but you can tell on this picture in particular, there is some webbing and it's sort of juxtaposed, superimposed onto the dark background on the sort of northwestern part of the picture. You can see these little dots and those are actually individual spider mites that are on the threads of their silken web. Next are the Tarsanemids, Tarsanemidae. Tarsanemid mites are thread-footed mites and they have a very peculiar, very specific kind of damage that they cause. In this picture we're looking at another example of Gerber leaves. These have become gnarled, kind of crumpled um, leaf structure. And this is caused by a phytoreactive saliva that a lot of tarsanemids have. In particular, this was a broad mite infested uh, plant. And you can see that their saliva causes this gnarling to occur that sort of curls the leaves in awkward and weird ways that really damages and impairs the ability for a plant to photosynthesize the way that it should. When one has assessed this sort of damage and they take a microscope and look, they might actually find tarsanemids. Tarsanemids are actually quite spry, as you can see in this video of broad mite on Gerbera leaves, that they're actually quite, they're, they're quite fast and they can move around quite a bit. So combined with the gnarled leaves and quick microscopic mites that have this ovoid shape, you may in fact be looking at a tarsanemid infestation. One of the most famous groups uh, is the poly polyphago tarsanemis genus and polyphago tarsanemis lattice or broad mite is probably the most infamous species and most widespread. Finally we have the areophyid mite family. Areophyids are sometimes referred to as blister or rust mites because they can cause a sort of rust-like look to appear on plants. They're also called gall mites because they can cause galling in certain plant species. This is all because, similar to tarsanemid mites, they have a phytoreactive saliva that causes physiological responses in a plant to occur. And in this case, we can see a cannabis plant that is curling in response to an infestation of hemp russet mite. A few important notes. Areophyid mites look very different from tetranychid or tarsanemid mites. The most obvious fact is that they have a vermiform or worm-like body, and that's the most obvious difference. They are also quite host-specific. Generally speaking, you won't find areophyid mites of different species on the same host. Usually you need a plant host as part of the diagnosing of a species. If you find areophyid mites as aeroplankton, just wafting around in the atmosphere, you might not know exactly what species it is unless you have an acarologist who is a taxonomic expert show you exactly what they are, and only a few experts have the ability to tell the difference. While this section might seem a little bit technical, I do think that it bears importance and it's helpful for some people to understand the different aspects of the physiology of these three families in relationship to themselves and in relationship to how they develop so that one can be better prepared when treating against the pest species. Specifically here, we have areophyid mites at the top. I've noted here the life stages as boxes. We have the pre-larval, larval, protonymph, deuteronymph, titronymph, and adult stage. Um, the adult stages of, are of some areophyid mites is somewhat interesting. These two morphs are the protogyne and the deutogyne. Protogynes are adult forms that are female that look like the males, and deutogynes are mite 
morphs that look very similar between species of Areophyids, in fact, but they are actually meant to hibernate. They are meant to be a response to the changing of seasons. They cannot reproduce in the same year or the same season that they were birthed, and they are meant to sort of hibernate while the seasons change until things become more hospitable, and then they can sort of overwinter in this form. So it's very important for people who are trying to combat these mites to know that, yes, in fact, these females, some of which, can actually overwinter. Tetranikids have a similar life stage history. They have pre-larva, larva, protonymph, deuteronymph, no tetranymph, and the adult stage. They just haven't developed the same uh, life stage for whatever reason, and there's nothing really significant about that change. Tarsonemids have a dramatically different life history that I'll go over here. They essentially have just a larval and an adult stage. You will, however, note that they do have a special pseudopupa stage that I thought was important enough to talk about. It is... Um, one of the only times I get to use this technical term, which is calyptostase. That basically means that the adult is sort of living inside a second skin, sort of a shell. And it is in this stage that some males of some species will uh, take the females, and uh, while they're still in this sort of um, isolated, immobile state, they will carry them somewhere else until it's time for them to mate which will happen immediately after the female becomes an adult, and the adult comes out of this um, pseudo-pupa. In the interest of keeping this as short as possible, I'm not going to go into too much more detail, only to say that, in general, these mite species are very different, and it's important to know physiologically what you're looking at and what your intent is for treatment, because different mites are going to have different susceptibilities, especially regarding biocontrol agents. Um, miticides might also have different effects depending on what species you're dealing with. So it's very important that has somebody identifies the kind of damage that you're seeing in your crop. Some other insect species and abiotic issues, such as problems with nutrients or herbicidal application can also cause similar kinds of damage. So it's very important to check and confirm that the damage that you're seeing is what it is and, is, and the source is what it is. So that's about it. That's what I wanted to talk about. If you have any questions, leave a comment below, send me a message on social media, and um, if you ever want me to talk about other subjects, feel free to mention that as well.